All right, so hello and welcome. This will actually cover chapter 12 of the of our new textbook here, The United States, A Brief History. And in fact, it covers the first half of chapter 12. So as you can see, it's only pages 125 to 130 on boom and bust, but not yet in Giel. A few key points. First of all, following World War I, Americans want a return to normalcy. We're going to try to define that term uh, and in, in fact, evaluate what it actually meant. And number two, that there's a tremendous amount of conflict and tension in the United States throughout what we often refer to as the Roaring Twenties. Now, as you may recall, there was a Russian revolution that occurred in 1917, it actually pulled Russia out of World War I and opened the door for the United States to join. And it was led by Vladimir Lenin and his Bolshevik party. Uh, but he instills this communist regime. And now the, uh, now the country of Russia will be called the USSR, it's the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So after World War I and after this Russian Revolution, there's a lot of concern about the political instability in Europe. And there's a strong anti-immigrant sentiment in the United States. It's a resurgence of nativism, which we talked about already. Uh, but as a result of this fear of communism, there is what we call the first Red Scare. And it's nothing more than extreme paranoia uh, and a fear that the communists have infiltrated the United States. And in fact, they're here to take us down from the inside. As a result of that, Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, as you can see here, uh, does lead the Palmer Raids, in which many suspected and known communists were rounded up and deported. This photo was actually taken at Ellis Island, and these people are awaiting their deportation. So it's pretty extreme. All right, so we've been evaluating primary sources and political cartoons all year long, but from here on out, I'd like to use this acronym to define exactly what I mean by that, and it's called HIP, right? Historical Perspective intended audience, purpose, and point of view. So in terms of historical perspective, we're looking at kind of where this is in history and, and what it actually means and what the significance of that is. The intended audience is exactly what it sounds like. The purpose, so why is this person creating this cartoon for that audience? What does this person hope to accomplish by creating this cartoon? And finally, the point of view. What point of view does this cartoon represent? What sort of influences go into that point of view? Now, if you want to pause the video and try to define this on your own, go ahead and do that now. I'm going to define this on the next slide. All right, so in terms of the historical context, uh, this cartoon represents the fear that uh, was pretty common in America, uh, sort of you know, collective action, if you want to think about it that way, or just radical ideas. And this cartoon actually builds a link between labor, taking that first strike of, our first step of going on strike, excuse me, and the downward spiral that would follow. You see Bolshevism there. Again, that's a reference to the Bolshevik party, the Russian Communist Party, and we're not even really sure what lies ahead at the bottom of that staircase. In terms of the intended audience, it's probably targeting Americans that may have been questioning the establishment, questioning Republican-style government, and considering adopting new radical ideas. And the purpose, of course, would be to discourage those Americans from adopting communism and other radical ideas. Now, the point of view, as you can see here, is that collective action, such as labor unions, would ultimately lead to a variety of very negative things. And so you have to ask yourself who might have that point of view. And I'm thinking business, you know, capitalists and industrialists and so forth, maybe uh, Republican government, uh, anybody who would be afraid of challenges to the norm, or in this case, perhaps the negative result of those challenges to the norm. All right, so keeping in line with fear of change or fear of the unknown, there is a strong resistance to immigration in the 19th century in the United States. And we've already talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act, in which basically all Chinese laborers were banned from coming to this country, and the Gentlemen's Agreement as well, in which uh, Japan agreed to stop sending immigrants to this country, and uh, schools were desegregated in San Francisco. And we did talk about nativism that resulted from the influx of the new immigrants, right? Those folks who came from Eastern and Southern Europe. But throughout the 1920s now, we're going to see quota laws passed which will set specific limitations as to how many immigrants could come from each country. Changing gears a little bit, you know, a lot of times we think about sort of the roaring 20s and, and we use phrases like the jazz age and we think about how fun and exciting it must have been. And certainly I think that there is some truth to that, but you have to understand that while younger people were embracing the flapper style, for example, or just rebellious and modern attitudes and behaviors, it, it kind of really scared the older generation. And, and parents were afraid that this marked 
beginning of the downfall of American society. And so while authors like F. Scott Fitzgerald and his great Gatsby and other works do sort of portray this and we look back upon it now and very fondly in its own day, it was very radical and it was very controversial. An example of that might be Margaret Sanger and her advocacy for birth control, something that challenged the norm greatly. And here are some flappers you can see here. And again, you know, this was deemed scandalous in its own day, but today you can literally go on Amazon and buy flapper costumes for toddlers. So you can see that, you know, what was one time radical is now very conservative. And that just changes as time moves on. One more thing I want to point out with this uh, divorce is on the rise. I already mentioned birth control. There is a real need to have smaller families, especially folks who are living in cities or living in the tenements. Uh, and, you know, you might recall that in terms of agricultural labor, it helps to have more families around, more hands on deck. But that's not necessarily the case in the cities for wage earners who have instead more mouths to feed. So there's significant changes that result to the family as well. Another big social experiment, prohibition. The 18th Amendment takes effect in January of 1919, and it bans the sale, manufacture, and transportation of alcohol. And what it did was it made something illegal. And what it didn't do was it didn't change people's minds and attitudes and behaviors. And so there's a real high demand for alcohol. And folks like Al Capone and organized crime in general will thrive off this black market that emerges. Younger Americans were openly defiant. Uh, as you can see here in this photo, here's a bootlegger from the 1920s, we'll just guess, maybe 1930s. And you, she gets that name from hiding her hooch in her boot. And here's a picture of Al Capone, who was finally um, convicted of tax evasion. Never convicted on alcohol-related charges, as far as I know. Okay, so as a result of these changing attitudes and ideas and, and new values and new behaviors, there's a real pushback from the older American traditional values. Uh, and a lot of, in a lot of ways, religion becomes sort of a cornerstone for this. And a religious revival known as fundamentalism begins in which a push for a literal interpretation of scripture and a rigid adherence to its message and its values uh, does emerge. And, and in a lot of ways, religion feels threatened by the developments in science, mainly Darwin's ideas of evolution. And so some states begin to outlaw the teaching of evolution in public schools altogether. Well, in Tennessee, a teacher named John Scopes accepted an offer from the ACLU to intentionally violate this law for the purpose of bringing it to the national arena. And a man named Clarence Darrow would defend Scopes. He's sort of a rock star lawyer in his own day, and William Jennings Bryan would prosecute him. And at the end of the day, Scopes is found guilty, but he's let off on a technicality. I think he had to pay a fine of $100. But what this court case really did was it, it, it sort of revealed these deep divisions in American society. Speaking of divisions, think about dividing opinions on Darwin, as you can see here in this cartoon. Why don't you go ahead and hit this? Again, that's historical context, intended audience, purpose, and point of view. All right, so KKK membership does increase throughout the, at least the first half of the 1920s. And uh, they will again continue to preach their message of hatred and they begin to warn about the moral deterioration of the real America. Uh, and they extend that hatred and bigotry towards basically all minority groups. And again, they continue to use intimidation and fear to try to keep those groups at a, at a lower level. Uh, they do march on Washington, D.C., as you can see here, without their masks, which again, giving up anonymity and, and making a, a stronger statement in doing that. In this photo from that same demonstration, you can see obviously they're using symbols of Christianity to try to uh, build a bond between um, some sort of pure Christianity and their message. You have to understand that from 1877 until the 1950s, the federal government, state governments, they don't do a whole lot for the cause of racial equality. And, and in fact, the Supreme Court kind of defends the idea of segregation in this court case, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. And basically it says that uh, there can be separate facilities for the races as long as those are equal. And we'll talk about that down the road and how they, you know, on an ideological sense, they cannot be equal because they are separate. But for the time being, there is this Jim Crow South in which the southern states uh, you know, often have laws to keep African-Americans in, in a subservient level.
And here is a very iconic photo you probably have seen before. I do believe it's in our textbook as well about those separate facilities. Now, while, of course, there were underlying racial issues throughout the early 20th century, there are a couple of things that may have brought those to the surface, the first of which may have been the migration to northern cities by large numbers of African Americans looking for jobs, obviously. And again, the federal government did not really do much to address these issues. So individuals such as W.E.B. Du Bois, a founding member of the NAACP, took up that cause themselves. Another example of something that may have caused some concern amongst Americans or some Americans would be the Harlem Renaissance. It's a very large literary and cultural movement. It's based in New York City in Harlem. It involved black artists, journalists, poets, and musicians. Uh, and younger Americans were more likely to embrace this and appreciate this artistic expression than uh, older Americans. All right, so other changes are happening as well, including technological advances. Uh, radio, for example, first hits the airwaves in uh, 1922. As you can see here, by the end of the decade, it's pretty much in every home. Charles Lindbergh, 1927, flew across the Atlantic Ocean. He's a national hero, and I do believe he had the largest ticker tape parade in the history of New York City. The following year, Millie Earhart did that as well. And keep in mind that aviation really began in 1903 in North Carolina, right? The Wright brothers, they kind of hop, skip, and jump. And now, 25 years later, a female pilot crosses the pond. Here is Charles Lindbergh in front of the Spirit of St. Louis. And here's Amelia Earhart. There are three Republican presidents throughout the 1920s. Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover. And we'll talk about them individually in the second year. But please write this down. Republicans then and now tended to side with the interest of business. And then that meant this laissez-faire economics or hands-free economics. To say it another way, the government should not get involved with the economy. Warren G. Harding is the first of those Republican presidents, and many people think that he's one of the worst presidents we've ever had. Uh, I guess he just had a hard time making any kind of decision whatsoever. Not a good decision or a bad decision, just no decision. Uh, he's probably overwhelmed by the job. Some might say incompetent. Unfortunately for him, he had quite a bit of scandal in, while he was in office, and much of that included or involved his cabinet, which we refer to as the Ohio Gang. They're all pretty much friends of his that he played cards with. And he's, they describe him as a good old boy, and perhaps he was chosen to be president in a smoke-filled room. So, again, he's sort of one of the boys. Uh, probably the most famous scandal of his presidency is the Teapot Dome scandal, in which the Secretary of Interior, Albert B. Fall, illegally leased public land uh, and, and profited from that. Now, Harding died in 1923, and his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, took over, who was then re-elected in 1924. Not a whole lot to say about Calvin Coolidge. We call him Silent Cal. One thing he did say was that the business of America is business. Again, reflecting that point of view of laissez-faire and pro-business government. Now, Herbert Hoover uh, was known for being the head of the FDA during the First World War. He's the meatless Monday guy we talked about, Chapter 11. Uh, but unfortunately for him, the, the stock market crashes during his time as president and the Great Depression begins. And so he's often blamed for the Depression because he didn't really do anything once the market crashed. And it's kind of unfortunate because he didn't necessarily invent this idea of laissez-faire economics. He's just sort of continuing this Republican tradition of very limited government involvement in the economy. Nonetheless, people criticized him. And they'll move off into these makeshift towns during the Depression as they sort of migrate from job site to job site. They call them Hoovervilles. And they also took their empty pockets and turned them out and called them Hoover flags. Just to get back to the key points, following World War I, America wanted to return to normalcy. Uh, and also, there was a great deal of conflict and tension in the country throughout the Roaring Twenties. A nice short answer question might be, to have you define what normalcy was in terms of 1920s America, as well as explain one or two examples of the challenges to that normalcy. Finally, if you can talk about sort of the reaction to those challenges, you have a pretty good idea about that tension and conflict in the 1920s. As a bonus question, this golfer won the U.S. Open four times between 1920 and 1930 as an amateur. If you could be the first person to tell me his name tomorrow, you get a bonus point on your upcoming quiz. That's it for today in Chapter 12, Part 1. Thanks for watching.